Well, good morning. Are you excited to be here this morning? Praise the Lord. And the kids, can, you can go ahead and um, come on up and take your place. Our creative arts program, our kids are doing so wonderfully, awesomely well. They are learning. They're learning how to share the gospel through bells, through uh, the, the puppetry, through band, through all kinds of, of, of media. And we're just so excited and this morning our handbell group they're going to be ministering to us and i'd just like to remind you in case you forgot that we do have a guitar group yes a guitar group so if you're interested and you are 16 and over 16 years and over that group is for you and we meet on sundays right after church for about an hour we won't be meeting today we'll resume next week so if you have any questions about any of the programs we offer it's still not too late to get involved especially if you're a volunteer please see me afterwards and our kids we they have been working so hard don't they look so smart with all their smiles yes okay praise the lord thank you so much young people praise the lord amen during the easter season we'll have uh, easter sunday we'll hear from several of our groups that's just one of them that you guys are wonderful i'm so proud of you and so glad you have so many gifts you're so talented and we're just starting to tap into that talent so thank god revandria where you at revandria okay okay revandria you know someone turned to me during the performance and said she's a genius you know you just do so much we love you we're so proud of you Amen. Yay. Mm -hmm. 
Amen. Your leadership is, is unmeasured. You know, this morning our treasurer was talking to me about something. She says, is she teaching these many private lessons too, along with all the groups of the church? I said, yep. She said, oh, boy. So, yeah, she's, she's going to town, so praise God. Well, listen, uh, we could tell you so much more. And um, for you who helped today, some of you are not even in the service because you went out, you, you have um, lunch that we're preparing for our, our guests. Don't worry, they'll eat in a little bit, but they came for spiritual food. That's why Pastor Karen wanted. And the rest of you did too, but you get spoiled because you're here every week. So it's my honor now, I should go back up here. I'm so short, they don't always pick up on camera. Um, it's my honor now to introduce Bishop Don Osborne. You heard her earlier as she talked about some of our material. She's fierce about the power of seed, and Pastor Karen alluded to that, that we have such good stuff that we want to share with our world. And so that's why she wanted to make the bookstore announcement. But really, her main task today is to deliver the word of the Lord. And so it's a wonderful honor for me. If you're watching, you don't know us. I'm the pastor here. My name is Pastor Cheyenne Mull Anthony. And um, yay, yay. But there's one greater than I. Aside from his name being Jesus, there's another one between me and Jesus. And uh, <laughs> it's our precious bishop. She is not only my pastor. I pastor this congregation. She's my pastor. But oversees over 800 churches. And she's also the, the president of the uh, Osborne Ministries International, which is a very wonderful, large, um, classic organization that has been ministering to millions of people all over the world. Um, it's been said that the Osborne family has preached to more people face-to-face, -face, seen more miracles than any person who's ever lived on the face of the earth. And so it's always an honor for us when Bishop is home and she's able to minister to us. So young people, wherever you are, get comfortable. Old people, wherever you are, stretch if you need to. Um, <laughs> hallelujah. And the rest of you, help me to welcome Bishop LaDonna Osborne. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Before you sit down, just raise your hand to heaven and say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for life, for breath, for the capacity to learn and to understand and to believe and to change and to grow and to impact my world. Thank you for your plan. I'm here. Talk to me. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Be seated. Thank you, Pastor, for inviting me to minister today. It's always an honor. Just so you all know that there's, we don't have a particular schedule for when I'm to preach. We like to keep folk guessing. And I think the pastor likes to keep us guessing. <laughs> so this morning she says, I did tell you that you're preaching this morning, didn't I? <laughs> you know, the scripture says be instant in season and out. It's really true. Sometimes by uh, about 11 o'clock Saturday night, I might dare to text her to say, mm, have you decided who's preaching tomorrow? And often, not always, some sh she will say, oh, you, didn't I tell you? <laughs> but you know what? The whole desire of our gathering together is that an atmosphere is created in which... Every person can have an encounter with Jesus Christ. That's what a gathering is all about. So we greet one another, we smile, we encourage, we love, we, we listen, we share, we give, we, we, we sing, we, we shake hands, we, we laugh, we, we do everything, and then comes the word of the Lord. And in the... In the word of the Lord in the atmosphere that's been created by God's people. Tremendous things happen. You've come today expecting. Well, I hope you have. I believe you have. That you did, wouldn't have bothered to come on a Sunday morning if you were not searching. In a mode to listen. You know how the I guess I can talk about recorders. I shouldn't talk about recorders, but the iPhone or the, some device that has a record button. The red button you push, and that's record. That's what we do when we come into the presence of the Lord and his people. We push the record button. 
so that we will be attentive and we will remember what the Spirit of the Lord says to us. Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, I thank you that your word is relevant, that your presence is guaranteed, that your life is available, that your promises are sure, that we are chosen, that we are on your mind. Thank you that today you, your word becomes flesh in your people. We are so grateful. Now may every ear and every heart be anointed to hear and receive for the purposes of your kingdom, and we say thank you. Today, uh, as you came in, you were given a bulletin that includes the activities of this church, but also you were given what we call uh, a mi our ministry by mail letter. This is our international ministry. Uh, some would call their, their ministry newsletter. We like to call this a photo report because there's not so many words that people might ignore them. I, I don't, uh, newsletters that come to me, they're all words I don't even read. I don't have time. I say, Lord, help me know what's here. There it goes. Uh, but, so I, I'm, I'm, to, I'm showing you this because the theme of this letter is, is very significant to the message the Lord's given me for you today. It's very simply, your life has purpose. Mm -hmm. Isn't that a wonderful thing to know? I want you to say, my life has purpose. My life has purpose. Say it again. My life has purpose. And follow that by saying, and I want to walk in it. And I want to walk in it. You see, that is the key. Spring has come in this part of the country. And so a, new, a newness of life is all around us. Newness of life is the norm in the kingdom of God. Bringing people in to newness of life is what the message of Christ is all about. But today, we're seeing the flowers are blooming. The red buds are beautiful, my favorite. The tulips are up. The daffodils are, are blooming. It's just a beautiful time of the year, spring, new beginning. And so it's time for us to reflect and reconsider our own lives. Our own lives. Who are we? Why are we here? What is the purpose? Well, our lives do have purpose. Your life has a purpose. Everything about life, it seems. I've been around the block a few times. Many of you have been around the block a few times. And there's something about the world that we're born into. A world of sin, a world of darkness, a world of bondage, a world of hopelessness. The world dominated by Satan. We're born into this world. Even when we find Christ, we're still in this world. And it seems that so much of the dynamics of this world are set against us. To distract us from God's purpose. See, God's purpose is a big topic. I want you to think big today. We could talk about just healing or just peace or just an, an aspect of the provision of Christ. But I'm talking about his purpose for your life. That's very, very big. Everything. Think about poverty and how it distracts us from God's purpose. But just as bad is riches. Distract us, can distract us from God's purpose. Sickness can distract us. It doesn't have to, but it can. Disappointments. Where it seems that every door closes in front of us. That distracts us from the bigger picture. Great opportunities also can distract us from God's purpose. Of course, bad decisions. How many has ever made a bad decision? I need about four arms and lots of fingers to say, yes, we all have made bad decisions. Addictions, imagine how addictions in a person's life distract them from God's purpose. Circumstances, everything imaginable in life. For our children, our young people, there are these distractions. Sometimes the home environment is a distraction from God's purpose. Sometimes school teachers, specific teachers, and, meant, and, and seeming leaders in their lives distract them from God's purpose. We're living in a day now that we have to really teach our children 
how to, how to withstand those things in the world. Sometimes to them it's other students. Kids, you know as well as I, there are just some mean kids out there. They don't know Jesus. They, mean is all they know. But they, are, they, they love to torment and distract you from the purpose that God has for you in that day. There are so many things. The point is, we have to decide that God has a purpose for our lives and become aware, be on guard against those things that distract us. There is a passage, a verse really, in the Gospel of John is what I'm going to give you today. And I'm going to just consider this my text. It's in John chapter 20, verse 21. This is set in the context of the life of Jesus after his death, his burial, his resurrection. After his resurrection, he came to where his disciples were frightened, hiding in a room, heart sick because of his death, they were, in, they were really distracted. They were in no condition to remember the words Jesus said, to act on them, to see the spiritual dynamic and victory that was going on, to face the darkness of their moment with faith that Jesus had said he was going to rise again. They were distracted by these many things. So Jesus walks in where they are. And his first words to them were peace. Is that not awesome? They did not have peace in that moment. But Jesus said, peace to you. And then this is the phrase I want to ring in your ears. From this day forward, I want you to hear this statement as though Jesus himself is looking in your face and telling you, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. As the Father has sent me, so also I send you. I don't know if that makes you very comfortable. It doesn't really me, because Jesus' mission was huge. And what he faced was, it seemed insurmountable. But as he was sent, we are sent. Inside this letter that I was referring you to, on page five, there is an inset that says, my father's final written blessing to me. I want you to look at this. I have it on a, on, a, on a little piece of yellow paper that he had cut out to save paper. He didn't waste anything. And he had hand wrote this to me. And I just tucked it away, not dreaming that would be the last written note that I would receive from him. And it said, just as you see there, God's work really depends on you. Doesn't that sound like something he would say? You who met him here every Sunday, weren't these the kind of things he said to you? Well, he was saying them to me also. God's work really depends on you. You are his voice of love in his name. Thank you. And by the time I got to that, I was crying. Because that was just big. Not because it was from my father, because when I first read it, he was still alive and with us. It was this big idea that the message and the spirit and the reality of God's love is confined to the likes of us. And who among us is qualified to deliver that kind of love and that kind of message in our world? But my father said, thank you, as though he thought I might be doing something right. We live for the day that we stand before the master and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. You see, these are the things, the scenes, the, the circumstances that we lift our sights and hearts to so that we're not distracted by the rubble of circumstances all around us. He said, thank you. I love you, your papa. And then he said, tell our partners. Of course, he wants everyone to know that God's work 
depends on people. So it's in that, in the spirit of this passion that I'm reminding you from the words of Jesus in the Gospel of John. As the Father sent Jesus, so does Jesus sends, uh, send us. During this year, we have, here at IGC, we have been really focusing on the message of the gospel and what it means in our lives. And we've been going from this pattern, the, what we call the gospel icon, or the gospel without words. Because it's in, it's in this story, understanding the one story of scripture in four events, that we really understand everything about our purpose. As, would, as we would understand everything else about our lives. But today we're talking about purpose. You see, you had purpose in the beginning. Do you believe that? Purpose in the beginning. Of course we know Adam and Eve had purpose. We often feel very far from the Adam and Eve lifestyle before sin. They had purpose. Let's just admit that. Let's start there. They had purpose. They were awesome. They were chosen. They were the image of God. They had the breath of God. They were given governance over all that God had created. They were in charge. They had authority. They had creative word power in their mouth. They had peace. They had provision. They had health. They had permission. They had blessing. They had instruction. They had communion with God. They had unbroken fellowship with one another. They had everything. Yes. Let's not forget that. Often when we think of Adam and Eve, all we remember is the fall. But that's not where we want to stay. The fall is just a piece of the story. What God did before sin is where we focus our attention so that we can discover God's great plan we had purpose in the beginning. What was that purpose? Very simple. We were made in the image of God. People were made in the image of God. Say, I am made in the image of God. That's it. Why were we made in the image of God? We were made in the image of God so that God could be seen. <laughs> God was spirit. Nobody could see him. Imagine, God created the heavens and the earth. He created everything, the mountains, the seas, the rivers, the beautiful environs that we live. This world is beautiful. All of this. And then he created a body. And then he separated that body into male and female, made in his image. And they were flesh and blood. Are you listening to me? And he breathed in the form and they became living beings because of the breath of God. You know this. So here, with all that God created, he wanted to be seen in a physical world. He wanted to be known. He was no longer content to just be spirit. He wanted to be flesh as well. He created, he, he, he participated, let us participate in the God revelation on earth. Is that not awesome? And so when he breathed in them, they, all of a sudden, God's life animated these beings and God could be seen. Are you hear, hearing me? They were made in the image of God. Their purpose was to make God seeable. But you see the purpose that we all had from the beginning, that was our created purpose. It was lost because of sin. And we were born into the world in that lost state. Not one of us was born a Christian. <laughs> there are no grandchildren in the kingdom of God. I was born in a Christian home. You know that. Wonderful parents. We had family devotions every day. I recommend it for every family. I, of course, every individual believer should be having time with the Lord. But a time where families sit around the word of God every day. My God, we have time for everything else. Yeah. How long does it take to go get a, a Coke, to drive through and get one thing? Oh, Mama, I want some French fries. Well, however long that takes, could we give at least that much time to sit those children around the Word of God and discuss the priority of God and His Word? What am I saying to you? 
I'm saying that when sin came, everything changed. So though I was born into this beautiful family, exposed to the word of God, exposed to the ministry of evangelism, there was, I was a lost sinner. I was on my way to hell. I had no peace. There was darkness that clouded my soul. I was doomed under the condemnation of death. I'm telling you, my condition was hopeless. For I could do no, I couldn't be good enough. I couldn't be a nice little girl good enough. I couldn't be obedient enough. I couldn't do enough chores. I couldn't do enough. At the age of seven, I saw Jesus. And when I saw him on the cross for me, because he loved me, everything changed. And I gave myself to him. And I just have to tell you, because I, think it's, I still think it's funny. I was, so, I was so aware of the bigness of God's love and the agony of his cross. And it seemed like all of that was just for me. I, I wanted more than anything in the world to say thank you. To give back something for all he was giving to me. And I had nothing to give. And remember, I was a little missionary kid. I didn't have one toy. I had done not... I don't think I even had a comic book. I don't know. I, I didn't have anything. I didn't have money. I didn't have influence. I didn't have, I might have had a hair barrette and rubber bands for my hair. I mean, we live very, very simple lives. So I just said to the Lord, I don't have anything to give you. But I'll give you my life. I'll give you my life. Oh, my. To my mind, that seemed like, like a piece of dust compared to what Christ had done for me and given to me. But in God's eyes, I didn't know until a long time later that that's really all he wanted. He didn't want my stuff. He wanted my life. And then he would deal with my stuff. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. But you see, we have to understand this condition that we're born into because it's that condition that's destroyed our purpose. We cannot fulfill our purpose in that condition of alienation from God. You see, when Adam and Eve turned away, self-rule elevated itself above the God rule. Self-will. What I want. When I want it. What makes me feel good. What I desire. What I have to have. What I've, all of that becomes the Lord. Instead of God being the Lord of every desire. Are you hearing me? Yes. Why did we fall and lose so much? Why did we think self-rule was the way to go? Let me tell you, it's very simple. We were blinded by Satan's deception. We were blinded. And I'm using that word very intentionally today. I want you to think about it. We have a sister who comes occasionally with Brother Randy, uh, who is blind, who sh she is blind. And every time I see her, I'm, I'm sure I'm speaking for several of you, every time I see her, I have such compassion. And I, inside I say, oh Jesus, I'm so glad I can see. I, I see what the things going on in the service and I'm thinking, this sister can't see these things. She, she has to go by what she can hear, what, she, what the atmosphere feels like. Oh, I say, Lord, help her see. Help her to see. Even though her eyes may not be open yet, may she see. Because being blind is never a choice. No one would choose to live a life of blindness. I'm not talking physical blindness. Talking blindness in all areas. We don't want to be blind about our own condition. We don't want to be blind about the train is coming. You better move your car. We want to see the train. We don't want to be blind to the schemes that are, that are trying to drag us into eternity as lost people. We don't want to be blind. But you see, the enemy blinds us so that we don't see straight. We see things through a distortion of lies after lies after lies after lies. You all know what I'm talking about. 
We were blind. You know, sometimes in that condition of sin, we think about the fact that we were, that, that we were condemned to die, that we were in bondage to Satan and to sin. We think of those things that are really very spiritual. But how often have you just realized we were blind? We were wandering around, stumbling around, not knowing where to go, not knowing where, if we had arrived. We were just lost. We were lost because we were blind. And Jesus then came. Say, Jesus came. Jesus. My friends, your purpose was restored. It was modeled by Jesus Christ. Jesus is the hope for the fulfillment of our purpose. Say, I have purpose. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus came. I, I love this. Let's think, think spiritual with me. We love to bring things into a physical realm, which is very important. But I want you to start with me in the spiritual. He came to open blind eyes. In Luke 4, chapter, verse 18. Remember when he stood in the synagogue and he read from the scroll of Isaiah, what we know as Isaiah 61. And... He says, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind and to release the oppressed and so on. Recovery of sight to the blind. My friends, we don't have to be blind anymore. We don't have to be blind to our condition. We don't have to be blind to our potential. We don't have to be blind to our purpose. We don't have to be blind. We can see what's going on. He came. He came. He reinstated our purpose. Oh, thank you, Jesus. He opened our eyes. I love to read the stories of Jesus opening blind eyes in the Bible because I believe blind people can be healed. We see blind people healed. We just came back from Liberia. And I don't know, Jennifer, how many blind eyes did we see come open? It was beautiful. Blind eyes are healed, but spiritual blind... There's just a few folk that are blind in the natural. But everybody's blind in the spiritual if they do not see Jesus. Until they've had their eyes opened so that they can see the truth and therefore walk in it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He came and reinstated our purpose. I said he came and reinstated our purpose. The scripture says to all who receive him, John 1, 12, to everyone who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children of God. Now, what is the first thing that happens when a baby is born? I don't mean the crying and all that. <laughs> Who does he or she look like? Does he look like his daddy or his mother? Does she look like her mommy or her daddy? What, is she a blend? Is he a blend? What is, what, that's the first question. Isn't that funny? Now, you know I'm telling the truth. Not that it matters, but we all want to know. The first thing that happens... In the heart of God, when you become a child of his, he wants to brag and say, look, they've got my character. They've got my face. They've got my smile. They've got my hands. Look, look, look. They've got my feet. They've got my heart. They're just like me. Our purpose begins the moment that we accept Christ. It's not a later thing after you've been saved 400 years and you've been through Bible school and you can rehearse all the books of the Bible and you know you fixed up everything that was broken and you cleaned it up and smelled it up and all that. Oh no, the moment you accept Christ, you are a child of God and no one can take that away from you. And when you know that truth and your eyes are open, you want walk differently. You think differently. You look at your world differently. You're no longer in bondage. You're free. For whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Hallelujah. I'm talking to you this morning. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. Ay, that's just too much. 
The salt is what makes the difference. As you, now, I have to admit to you that if I were God, I would have had a backup plan. You know, to just depend on the likes of you. If you were it, you're the ones that's going to take my message to the ends of the earth. You, 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 you. You're the one. Oh, well, ooh, if I were God, I'd be scared already. Because I know a little bit about human nature. <laughs> How much more does he know than I? And yet he has no backup plan. He says, no, it's going to be you. I trust you. I tr this, is, this is why you were created. This is, I formed you before you were even born. I had this plan for you. And you're up to it because I'm with you. You can do this. You're going to make a difference because you're mine. And everything you need, you inherit from me. Just step back from all those distractions and say, where's my inheritance? I said, step back from all those distractions and say, where is my inheritance? Jesus has reinstated our purpose. He said, you're the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp, put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. I'm talking about your purpose. And in the same way, let your light shine before people that they'll see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Hallelujah. As the Father sent Jesus, so Jesus sends us. Now, let me just, let me just clarify. Let me clarify. This morning we shared the communion around the Lord's table, and we shared together in these elements one being the bread, the other being the wine, representing the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Often we come around this table and we're just thinking about our sins being forgiven, or our bodies being healed. Wonderful, praise the Lord. But why not remember our purpose? Right. Do you remember what the scripture said? Jesus said, he was holding the bread on that last Passover with his disciples. He took the bread and he broke it. And he gave to each of them and he said, take and eat. This is my body. We were in um, Uganda conducting a, the ordination of about 100 women, which was a historic feat. They had asked us to come and make this statement on behalf of women in ministry. Well, one of the things they wanted to do was have communion together. And so I, I told them, I said, fine, you prepare the communion for, for the whole assembly, and, and, but give me a little loaf of bread. Just, just not a sliced loaf, not, not, just, just not a big loaf, just, just a, a small loaf. And put it there by the pulpit. And so we had the communion service, and in order to help these people really understand what you and I must really understand, I took that little loaf and I, I called 12 women to come and sit in 12 chairs. They came and sat down. And as, as I was talking about what Jesus did at that, on that night, I just took the bread and I began to gave each, give each one a piece until the bread was all gone. I had broken it in 12 pieces. They all, I says, now eat it. It was quite a big piece of bread, so I just waited, kept preaching. And I said, no, just keep eating, keep eating. And I just kept preaching, keep eating, eat it. It's all, i got to be all gone. Eat it, kept preaching. When they were all done, I says, now, come and stand here in a group. They came and stood here. And I asked the people, where's the bread? Where's the bread? Because you see, together they formed the loaf. Together they were whole. Together, they were the body of Christ. Do you see? This is what we must understand. That Jesus, remember, remember the example in uh, Mark chapter 6, when the 5,000 had followed Jesus and they were hungry. And Jesus turned, I think it was to Philip, and he said, 
You give them something to eat. Now, we read that story, and we, we discern many truths from it, but Jesus prophetically was declaring the purpose of his church, of his people, of those who would believe on him, that they were called and positioned to give the people something to eat. We are the ones who satisfy the hunger, the need, the desperate hopelessness of people in our world. Are you hearing me? Thank you, Jesus, for such trust. Thank you, Pastor. Give them something to eat. Paul understood this, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians Chapter 10, verse 17, he said in such a matter-of-fact way. Now, just listen to this. He says, for we being many are one bread and one body. For we all have partaken of that one bread. You see, that's who we are. Our lives have purpose. Jesus, some of his final words to his disciples recorded in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He says, you're going to receive power. Because you see, all that I've described to you up to now is impossible. We can't be one bread. There is not unity between two people. <laughs> you, know, you, you, you know, you've heard this statement, uh, it's, it's you and me against the world. Everybody else is wrong but us. And sometimes I'm, I, I wonder about you. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's just that, that whole result of sin that, that we, we, we just can't do it together. We've got to be a one-person show. You know, we're just diseased with this self-rule thing. We come to Christ, we take on a new lifestyle, a new perspective. We are not, we're no longer I, we are we. We are no longer self-centered. We are others-centered. We are no longer just me and my needs. It's us and the needs and the provision and the opportunity of the body of Christ. There is a purpose. That holds us together. A purpose that sustains us. What am I talking to you about? I'm talking about your life. Your purpose. Now you're looking at me. I don't know what you know about me. Pastor Shine always calls me an evangelist. I don't know what that means. But I think it means I'm loud. <laughs> and I have to finish my whole sermon. She says a pastor is going to see you next week. They don't have to finish it all. But maybe that's it. I don't know. But whatever it is. I can tell you for sure that I, when I talk about purpose and, and being the reflection of God and making him known and visible in the world, I am not singling out evangelists as the one kind of unique person or personality or calling or example or model as that's the one fulfilling the purpose. No, no, no. My father, a great evangelist. But he understood that the work of God is done by every individual believer who understands who they are as the body of Christ in the earth. We have one purpose. Call your church whatever you want to, your denomination, whatever it is, whatever. If we're Christian, we are members of one body. His name is Jesus. And we are not allowed to withhold the member that we are. Have you ever imagined, imagine a picture of the body of Christ? But it's like a war vet coming home on a crutch with a leg whacked off and one arm gone and this side of the face deformed. Stumbling around on one crutch, trying to, the body of Christ, if a member is absent, the body of Christ cannot function. Listen to me, the war is over, Christ is victorious, his people have been redeemed, we are restored, we are knit together, we have become one, we are whole, we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we have power. 
power. We have authority. We have a responsibility. We can't just lay down and say, my part doesn't count. My purpose is too small. No, no, no. The body of Christ is not complete if we are not connected. I want you to say, my life has purpose. purpose. I'm telling you, the purpose of God for you is big. It is so, so big. We're to know him. Oh, my friends, number one, we must know him. I love what Pastor Dudley said when the Lord revealed to her and showed my father to her when she didn't know T.L. Osborne from, uh, I could say, a man in the moon. (laughs) But, But in the dream... The Lord said to her, ask him to tell you everything he knows about Jesus. And when she said that to me back in November, December, I just, I just started smiling. I said, well, yeah, you've come to the right place. I might not have known why you came, but now I know because this is the place that knows about Jesus. Jesus is everything. He is the theme. He is the alpha. He is the omega. He is the beginning. He is the end. He is life. He is the healer. He is the forgiver. He is the restorer. He is the life giver. He is the spirit. He is purpose. He is provision. He is peace. He is joy. He is all things. Sanctification holiness, righteousness. He is life. All things are in him. So our first step is to know him. And that's why we can say, so matter of factly, whatever you need, Jesus is the answer. And you can't have him living in you and be sick and be addicted and be depressed I'm t- yeah, let me just stop. Yeah, there's a couple here that I know of, and I'm sure there are others who are struggling physically. I'm not saying Jesus isn't in you. You know that. But for the sake of others, I have to clarify. This is a journey you're walking through. You're in- he- Christ is in you. Healing is at work. We know that. So we don't curse the sick. We stand with the sick. Hallelujah. Jesus is the healer. He is restoration. He is our hope. His promises are true. I'm saying to you, whatever you need, you find the solution in Jesus. Addiction cannot keep hold on you. And and let me just say, some people teach this thing called generational curses. And they've got to be broken. I mean, just say they were broken at the cross. When you come to Jesus, let me say it clearly. When you come to Jesus, you are part of a new generation. You are part of a new generation. The generation that began when Jesus came out of the grave uh, that continues until he breaks the clouds and he does the sins and he catches us up to be with him. As one generation, this generation shall not pass until we see the Son of Man coming. Generational curse, that's all. That, do I have to tell you, whoever's in Christ is a new creation. All things are passed away. I don't care what Papa did, or Mama did, or Grandma did, or what they consecrated you to. All things are past. All things are new. That's it. You're new. There is no curse that can hold you. Oh, come with me to the ends of the earth. People live in bondage to curses. We've got Africans here from many countries. They know more about curses than they know about anything. And all the message of Jesus comes, breaks those yokes. They take off that juju. They take off all that stuff. They denounce the witch doctor. The preachers denounce the witch doctor. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. Did I mention that you've got a purpose? And your purpose is to know him. 
Know him so that circumstances don't distract you. Know him so whatever lie the enemy tells you, you stand up to him and say, get out of the way, you liar. You have to know him and make him known. Make him known. And you, what I'm saying, I'm not, I'm not preaching for evangelists. I'm preaching for Christians, for believers. Everyone is a witness. Everyone is salt. Everyone is light. Everyone, I don't care what you're doing. If you're passing out cards on the street, you are a witness of Christ. <laughs> this is really good. <laughs> God gives us purpose beyond our means. Who of us qualifies? We're a joke. But we carry the life of God by his spirit. And nothing can stand before us. Nothing can hold us because we know who we are. And we know why we're here. So even while we're on the journey of restoration and recovery and all of this process of learning how to submit to the Spirit of God at work in our lives, nevertheless, during all that time, we remember we've got purpose. Everything we do, everything we say, we remember we have purpose. Remember your identity. You're a child of God. You are the image of God walking around. What kind of God do you want people around you to see? Let him be known. Hallelujah. Let him be known. Let him be known. Stand to your feet if you're able. Thank you. Stand to your feet. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. How many of you want to fulfill your purpose? Hallelujah. How many of you don't want sickness to stand in your way? How many of you don't want addiction to stand in your way? You don't want bondage of any kind. You don't want any distractions. I want you to raise your hands as high as you can. I want you to raise them to heaven in this beautiful act of surrender. I love it. But I don't really see it so much as, although I believe in surrender, I see it as, oh Lord, my hands are open. Fill them. They're the, they're the conduit to my life. I'm reaching to you. And I'm accepting by faith. Come on, open your, open your mouths and repeat what I'm saying. Close your eyes and say, Jesus, I receive from you all that you have. Your purpose is mine. Your life is mine. Your peace is mine. Thank you for giving my sins. Thank you for healing my body. Thank you for declaring me not guilty. Thank you for removing my guilt. Thank you for giving me a new beginning. Thank you for filling me with your spirit. I am your child. I am your image. I look like you. I am walking in my inheritance. And I am changing my world. For this is my purpose. And I'm walking in it. By the power of the Holy Spirit. By the will of God. In the name of Jesus.